In Regina, we not only have a, a fine gallery, but we have an outstanding group of young artists who are producing works uh, which we think will be of great historic value. Uh, many people don't know of the Norman Mackenzie Art Gallery on College Avenue, and uh, so we want to encourage those who don't come to the gallery to see these works of art. In other words, we want to uh, bring the artist and his work to the people. We never thought of us being collectors. We just bought the things that we liked. This is, of course, my very favorite. And I love it because it can fit anywhere in the hand. It was an early one. Most of the early ones didn't have bases. It can go on its back or it can go on its stomach. It can go anywhere you want to go. And that was the beauty of it. I like all the rest, too, of course. You, you know, it's whatever happens to you that day, something sticks out that you've forgotten you had it. And I recall, you know, I was talking to Cindy, and well, what is Jackie's character? And what I said to David I, is that I thought it was something that would be sophisticated, elegant, a little mischievous, and French. Jackie's a well-known patron of the arts. She and her husband, the late Dr. Morris Schumacher, have generously donated monetarily and personally to cultural facilities and other organizations in Saskatchewan and across Canada. We got married in Toronto, April the 18th, 1955. Went to New York, Portugal, and then Spain, across to Greece. From Egypt, we went to Iraq, to Lebanon, to Pakistan, to India, to Nepal, and then we got to Israel. We came back via Europe, and we went to France for him to meet my relative. Four months. Well, I was aware of art because of the way Pat did that, and then and he, he could draw good art as well as, as a comic. Mama's aunt in France was a painter, and so we had some of her paintings, and when we went in 33, we saw a lot of art then. And I picked a small one of the Coq du Nord. That's the beginning, I think. He collected before because he'd gone to Japan, and he'd always had a love of Asian things. He was born in Calgary, the second child of Abraham and Luba. And he was very poetic. He took the violin and he played with the orchestra in Calgary. He was Tommy Douglas's counsel and uh, advisor. My mom and dad met uh, during the First World War. And mom was a, a teacher as well as a photographer. Then dad took mom to Winnipeg for a honeymoon. Dad came in 1926. Mom, Pat, and I came in 27. He was seven and I was four. We lived on the north side of Regina, on the seven block Robinson. I think the plumbing stopped at the eight block. So we had to walk to get our water, and then we had an outhouse. We knew there was a lot of people that didn't have even what we had. The way my mom handled things, we never thought of ourselves as being poor. Shumi and I started collecting this back in the 50s. And he, actually, he started, I should give him credit, because uh, he was with the boys going fishing in Lac Larange. And there was a Hudson's Bay post at the time, and Shumi saw a few of these larger pieces. And his friends all laughed at him and thought he not only had rocks in the back of his car, but also up here. Of course, a few years later, they had to eat their words, <laughs> and they'd wish they had bought some too. This is um, one of my collection of Inuit sculpture. It comes from Cape Dorset. As you'll see, it is a very impressive face. The arms stretch out, giving it an angelic sort of look. In addition, of course, it, on the reverse side, there is another face. Moira and I went to Rankin Inlet. This chap was very good, and we could see the work that he and the students had done, and this was one of them. And that was in the middle of that. I said immediately, I'd like that one, <laughs> before anybody had a chance to say anything. <laughs> Rankin is the only one that ever did Playworks. They stopped in the 80s, and then in 2000 and something, uh, a couple from New York came, and they started teaching the Inuits in Rankin how to capture it again. The ones in the other house are all red clay, and those three pieces are the, before the 80s. The docent program just started in the 60s, so I was one of the first docents to, to go to the schools. Uh, I had more fun with the sculptures because I actually took a couple different ones each time and I'd let them hold it and they would feel 
the substance. And with paintings, you can't let them touch. So this was one time that they could touch, and they really enjoyed it. So I took the bear, and I asked them, what do you think the bear's doing? They all said, eating a hamburger. <laughs> Up north, no, I don't think so. Think again, they, they couldn't. And I said, well, he's a white polo and he's got this black nozzle, so he's covering it so that his prey, they don't see him coming. Smart little man. Was there a way that you collected in shimmy? Yeah, in some ways. Sometimes we just go to, say, Victoria or Banff, but he also had an end to the Hudson's Bay collection in Winnipeg. The first time we went in, we picked some things and they said, oh no, we want that for our collection. So after that, we were smart and we said, which have you picked for your collection and which can we look at? <laughs> <laughs> I have a little ivory boat. This is the one that I first bought from the uh, Hudson's Bay house. And you can see how it is incised and it's very, very fine and everything comes apart. I think that was $12.50 in those days. We discovered these dolls with the fur that Shumi had bought in 1989. I don't know where he bought it, and I didn't know they were there until we started cleaning out the basement. The Harlequins are from our honeymoon in Venice, and some of the others are other trips that we've had. We had a tendency of buying things that were particular to the place that we were living in or visiting at the time. Shumi loved the oriental things, and so he was always saying, you know, we should have one piece in the room only. Well, we failed. We tried. <laughs> we had a room there that we call the Japanese room, and it had the little hanging and the, and the table and the tankos and all that. It got overloaded. I guess we bumbled along. Well, in the 50s when Ken Lougheed and the others were here, that's when we started buying. In fact, Shumi had a, a contract, like the old-fashioned types in Europe. Uh, he'd pay Ken Lougheed so much every month. And at the end of the year, uh, Ken would say, well, you can choose a painting or you can choose this. So that kind of a patron. Ken Lougheed, of course, was one of the favorite painters of Jackie and myself, and one of our very best friends. And during his sojourn here, he came up with so many ideas and so many odd paintings. He would bring them to us from time to time. This was one he brought one Sunday morning and gave it to Jackie and to me. And we debated what it was. Jackie, of course, has the best imagination about these paintings, particularly of Lougheed's. And she called it Don Quixote. I think she was absolutely right. He went completely to these black and whites. And that was one of the first ones that he did. And then from that, he went into what I call the roller area, where you have the canvas on the floor, and you roll these things this way and that way. And I said, Ken, you're wasting your talents. That's what everybody else is doing. You can do better than that. We didn't buy one of those. We, it's just, it just wasn't Ken to us. And then he got back into doing other things, and he's really, really good. Here, one of uh, Art Mackay's Mandela series. This is a very unusual Mandela, most of them having been painted in browns and blacks and other muted shades. This is the only painting I have seen of his using the kind of colors which we have here. First time I saw Alan Sapp's work was up in the uh, Sask Power when they were smart enough to have a nice gallery and he had his little ones like that and they were fine, beautiful things. Well, this is Doris McCarthy, and we have another one of hers, first time we bought the other one, and uh, she's an amazing individual. She's written several books, and she also had a cottage on the island, and uh, she's donated that to, for artists. So she's really a wonderful person. Some of these have been given to Shumi to, by First Nations. Uh, yes, she went to a lot of ceremonies. She did a lot of the trees. Uh, for Douglas. This is Victor Sikonsky. We first got Sikonsky's work when he had a sort of portfolio with money hanging out of it. Then I've got other Sikonsky's, but this is one that really appealed to us. Assuming I had differences in that. I like smaller pieces and he liked bigger pieces. 
And then later on, he started liking smaller pieces too. We never had really disagreements. It was just sometimes, well, we think about it and we walk around the block a bit or two and go back and buy it. And well, you know, a couple of times I said, we don't really have room. That's, not, that's beside the point, he said. You get it when you see it and you like it, otherwise it won't be there when you can. The arts, wider arts, have given Shumi and myself a lot of pleasure. And we know that the artists in all fields do it out of passion, their love of the arts, and not for the money. I try and tell people, well, why don't you get this, or why don't you do this, and why don't, well, I might do it in my will, but why don't you do it when you're still alive and you can see the effect of what you're doing? It's the best dividend you can get for your money. Really?